Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Ely, a geologist with the Nevada Division of Minerals. A geologist is a type of scientist that studies rocks, the minerals rocks are made out of, and all the processes that shape the earth the way we see it today. What I don't get to study is anything alive, so no plants and no animals, and I also don't get to study the weather. Today we are going to begin a multi-part learning adventure on two very closely related processes, weathering and erosion. Weathering and erosion result in many of the landscapes that we see around us, like the one that we see in this picture, or like this one, or even this one. In this video series, we will model different natural processes so that we can make observations about weathering and erosion that usually take hundreds or even thousands of years to occur. By the end of our erosion video series, you'll be able to answer questions like, what causes rocks to break? How do these processes help to shape the Earth's surface? How can humans prevent erosion? And what happens to the broken pieces of rock? Weathering is the process of a big rock or a mountain being broken into smaller rocks called sediment. There are three types of weathering. The first type is biological weathering. Biological weathering is when living organisms like plants, animals, and bacteria contribute to breaking the rocks up. In the pictures, we see trees whose roots have grown through the rock. As the roots grow bigger and go deeper into the ground, they will continue to break the rock into smaller and smaller pieces. Root wedging, like we see here, is an example of biological weathering. Chemical weathering refers to the disintegration of rocks due to a chemical reaction. For example, rainwater can combine with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, making it slightly acidic. That weakly acidic rain then eats away at rocks like this limestone that we see in the picture. Many caves are formed by chemical weathering. The last type of weathering is mechanical or physical weathering. This type of weathering is the result of some physical force like water, wind, ice, or even variations in temperature. All of these forces work to, um, on the rock to break it up. Frost wedging, like we see in this picture, is an example of mechanical weathering. Water can collect in the cracks of rocks. When the temperature drops, the water freezes, and that causes it to expand by 9% in volume, wedging the rock apart, making the crack bigger. This freeze-thaw cycle repeats over and over again, breaking the rock apart a little bit more each time until finally it's broken. Erosion is the process which transports the sediment or broken pieces of rock to a new location. Erosion is always mechanical. In other words, the sediment is being transported by water, wind, ice, or gravity. As our rock travels along, it will be broken into smaller and smaller pieces from the size of your fist to the size of an egg, to the size of a pea, to the size of a grain of rice or smaller, our rock has turned into a piece of sand along its erosional journey. So what happens when our sediment is transported or eroded away from the place of weathering? Well, eventually it is deposited into a new location but there's more sediment that's continuing to be deposited on top of it. So as more and more sediment is deposited, 
the rocks become buried or these tiny grains of sediment become buried. And that weight of the sediment that's on top of it that continues to be deposited squeezes the sediment together or compacts it. That causes all of the water to come out of the sediment and then the grains can be cemented together. Once cementation occurs, we formed a brand new sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rocks are the type of rock where we find fossils. For the first segment of the erosion series, we are going to look at coastal erosion. All of my favorite features about visiting the coast are actually caused by weathering and erosion. There are many powerful forces of erosion present in coastal environments. The heat from the sun, the power of the wind, but for our purposes today, we are going to focus on the erosion that waves cause. In order to understand how rocks are broken and transported away by waves, we need to take a closer look at how waves work. Waves are caused by energy passing through the water. Most common surface waves are caused by wind blowing along where the water and the air meet. The energy then results in this circular motion of water molecules and the formation of waves. If you have ever seen a buoy bobbing up and down in the water, you've witnessed the circular motion of waves. The buoy appears to lurch forward and upward with the wave, but then it falls down and back in an orbital rotation as the wave continues by, eventually ending up in the same location as it was before the wave came by. Coastal areas also experience something called tides. There are two low tides and two high tides for every lunar day. So a lunar day is a little bit different than our typical 24 hour day because a lunar day has 24 hours and 50 minutes. So a low tide is when the sea level reaches its lowest point and the high tide is when the sea level reaches its highest point. But tides can really be thought of as really long waves that move across the ocean. The crest of the wave, that peak of the wave would be our high tide and the trough of the wave would be our low tide. But what causes these tides to form in the first place? So tides are actually the result of a gravitational force exerted on the earth by the moon. And this causes a tidal bulge on the side closest to the moon. So if you can imagine the earth's ocean was shaped kind of like a, a, an ellipse or a football, then the point of the football, one of the points of the football will point towards the moon. So that's where we have the bulge, the tidal bulge caused by the gravitational force of the moon. On the other side, it's actually caused by inertia because the gravitational pull of the moon is weaker on the far side of the moon. It's unable to pull that water towards it. And so inertia wins and you end up with a bulge on both sides. So where you have the points of the football is where high tide is on the earth and where you have the flat parts of the football is where low tide is on the earth. So how do waves and tides relate to erosion? Remember that waves represent energy that's passing through the water. Because waves create this high energy envi environment, especially close to the shore, this means that fine grain sediments, so the smallest pieces of broken rock, are unable to settle and be deposited. So they're suspended floating around in the water. Waves and tides are constantly moving sediment around. 
Uh, and because the waves have all of this sediment, every time the waves crash into a landform, it also is bringing that sediment with it. So it's not just the power of the water that's weathering and breaking these rocks, but it's also the sediment that's contained in the water that's helping to further break these rocks. Let's take a look at the diagram on the right side of the screen. At time one, we see the sea and the cliff. And then jump ahead to time two and the waves and all of that suspended sediment has had time to chip away at the cliff face, create, uh, causing it to be undercut and creating an overhang. So the undercut is marked by a little case, a lowercase e, and uh, the overhang is marked by a uppercase a. And then we go to time three and our overhang has collapsed under the force of gravity plus other erosional forces. We see the formation of a wave cut platform at P. And then we also see how the waves are starting to cut out a new undercut into the cliff face. And we see that the larger grains have been deposited. So not only do waves work to break apart cliffs like the one in this diagram, but they're also depositing sediments and taking sediments away when they reach the beach. So uh, on the beach, one of the landforms that we commonly see is a cusp horn. And you can see these little arches in the picture on the beach where the sand is wet. So that's where the backwash is coming up. So when it does that, it's actually depositing the bigger uh, grains of sand and gravel at the cusp horn. And then it's taking the finest grains of silt and clay back into the ocean with it, where it's later deposited underneath the water. I wanted to take a moment and discuss this landscape and point out some of the erosional features we're able to observe in this picture. Starting at the left side of the picture, at the very base of the cliff, we can see that the cliff has been undercut. It has more erosion at the base as a result of the waves that are crashing into it. Higher up on the same cliff, we see plants are growing. Their roots are growing inside of the rock, wedging those pieces apart and breaking some of the rock off. Moving further right to the most prominent feature in the picture, we see the arch. The arch is really cool because it represents a weaker part of the rock that was eroded away first. In other words, the remaining cliff that we see is stronger than the rock that was once inside of that arch. The actual arch remaining will eventually break with time and it will become a sea stack. A sea stack is what we see in the back right hand side of the picture. At one point, that sea stack was likely a part of this same cliff, but because of weathering and erosion, it was broken apart and it may or may not have had an arch that connected it, but with time that would have collapsed. And so the only bit of the cliff that we have preserved is the sea stack left in the water. Now it's time to start gathering your supplies for the activity. You'll need a pencil and you'll need to download and print the accompanying worksheet. But if you don't have a printer or if you're like me and you're terrible about buying ink for your printer, you can just use a plain piece of paper. So pause the video now and gather your supplies and I'll see you in a few minutes. Before we get started, let's take a moment to go over the worksheet. We're going to be using the same worksheet for the first three videos in the series. The first thing we're going to do on the worksheet is identify the agent of erosion. In other words, what is causing the erosion? Is it water or is it wind? And we're going to circle our answer. The next part of the worksheet, we're going to draw a before picture in the box. I'm going to show you what our experiment, our erosion activity looks like before we run our model so that you can draw the landscape the way it looks before 
it's had erosion happen. After you draw the before picture, then you can form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction or an explanation that can be tested through a study or an experiment. In other words, it's a statement about what you think is going to happen. So I want you to write a hypothesis and tell me how you think the landscape is going to change from our model. After we've done these three parts of the worksheet, we will run the model. When the model is done, then we will draw an after picture. By drawing an after picture, we'll be able to compare it to our before picture and observe all the changes that have happened to our landscape. We'll also be able to review our hypothesis and answer our last question, was your hypothesis correct? So in other words, did the landscape change in the way that you expected? Or were you surprised by the results of our model? So you're again, you're just going to circle yes or no to whether your hypothesis was correct. Let's get started on our activity. For our model, we will be using water, sand, a paint pan, and an empty plastic water bottle. To get started, we're gonna add our sand into the paint pan, and then we're gonna pat it down so that it's all level. I put my sand on the sloped part of the paint pan, and then I used my hands to pat it down level and create a cliff. Now we are going to add the water. Once I've added the water, pause the video to complete the first half of the worksheet. What is the agent of erosion? Draw a before picture of the landscape and form a hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen? Now I'm going to use my empty water bottle to create waves. I'm going to place the bottle in the water and push it up and down, which will displace the volume of water and create waves rather than me having to rely on wind today. Pay close attention to what's happening to our landform. As the waves crash into our landform, you should be able to observe certain changes. Has any of our landform failed and fallen into the water? Has the shape of the landform changed in any way? This is what we really want to pay attention to and record in an after picture to test our hypothesis. Now that we've run our model, we can observe all the changes that happened to our landscape. I waited a few minutes before taking this picture so that you could see what it looked like with clear water. I wanted all of that sand to settle out of the water so that you could have the best view. At this time, I want you to pause your video and draw an after picture. When you're done drawing the after picture, compare it to your before picture. How has the landscape changed since we ran our model? At that point, I want you to review the hypothesis you wrote. Was your hypothesis correct? Did the model change the landscape the way you expected it? Or were you surprised by some of the changes you observed? Thank you for joining me for part one of the erosion video series. I hope you'll join me next time as we take a closer look at how wind can modify landforms. If you have any questions about today's activity, please feel free to post them in the comments or send me an email at rely at minerals.nv.gov. See you next time for part two of the erosion video series.